Isn't that exciting? Yes. If you're not excited about Jesus, you're worth it. <laughs> well, you know, I heard, heard a story the other day that really, uh, really touched me. It was you know, how much we've uh, preached in the areas of how important your words are. They're really important, aren't they? The words that you speak are really important. So there's these three guys in the cafe drinking their cappuccinos and they have these muffins with cream on. You know, the ones you got to, if you eat them, you've got to have a cream oil run. And they were discussing the word. And they're getting quite into it. And one of the guys said, you know, the words we speak are very important, aren't they? He said, well, they really are. He said, I proved it. He said, my wife was reading a book called The, the uh, Tale of Two Cities. And he said, I ended up with twins. Well, that's interesting. And the guy said, well, I was... My wife was reading the book on the Three Musketeers, and she ended up with triplets. The other guy went as white as a sheep, and they said, what's the matter with you? He said, oh, my wife's reading Anna Barbara and the Forty Thieves. <laughs> <laughs> so see, your words are important. <laughs> That's a good one, Charlotte. <laughs> what are you reading? <laughs> Okay, we're talking on the identification with Christ, which is a very important thing if we can really grasp this. I think your life will change. I know it changed mine. As a, the more I studied it, the more I, I became convinced how much God loves me. And you know, we hear about um, oh, well, the, you know, the Ten Commandments and the first two, and you go to love to the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind. Well, actually, it's 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 not totally true because. You know, the, the truth is that it's how much God loves you is the key factor. Amen. When you realize how much He loves you, that makes you able to love Him in a greater dimension. If you focus on, I've got to love God, I've got to love God, you, you're really going to work hard at it because if you don't grasp the initial love that He has for us, you, you, you find it a struggle all the time. So I finished uh, last, last time I spoke. With these, just these words in mind. Ephesians 2 6 raised us up with him and made us to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He became as we were so that we might become as he is. He died to make us live. He, made a, he was made sin to make us righteous. He became weak to make us strong. He suffered shame to give us glory. He went to hell in order to take us to heaven. He was condemned in order to justify us. He was made sick in order that healing might be ours. He was cast out from the presence of God in order to make us welcome in heaven. And that also, just those, just those few words are so impacting. When, we, when you look at the, the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, he was literally a brutalized one man. The very people he came to save, to set free, he was brutalized for. And the word says that at any time he could have called a legion of angels to say, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, I, I, yeah, put, put yourself in this position. If you've been bashed up, brutalized by some person, You'd have to be very, very strong in character to be able not only just to forgive them, but not to want to turn around and say, God, turn them into little piles of dust. <laughs> not you? Okay, well, I would. <laughs> all right. Can't convince you. You're all so spiritual, but I, I still have problems, you know. I still have problems of, um, of things that upset me. You know? Wow, man. Perhaps we should change places here. <clears throat> you know, like driving is, is, is one that I really had to ask the Lord for patience and forgiveness. Because people that drive 80 k's on the open highway, then come to the double overtaken lines and go up to 110, they infuriate me. Because I know I've got to do about 150 get past them, and that's just the time the little blue man comes over the, over the horizon <laughs> and says hi. You know, so God's still dealing with that. I pour out my love upon them. God, 
over. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all a work in progress. Remember, we are all a work in progress. What somebody else is, is um, overcome, there's something in your life that you really need God for. You know what I'm saying? You, yeah. the, the presence of God is what changes us. And I, and I found that. I, I started to get really infuriated with those sort of things. And, and I said, Lord, this is not right. I shouldn't be doing this. I thought, I'm a pastor. <laughs> you know, um, I, I shouldn't feel this way. And he, he said, well, it's up to you. I felt, Lord, well, it's up to you. It's your choice. Cool. It's a fair comment. It's a fair comment. <laughs> so I just started to, you know, when, when that happens. And you know, the angrier you get about things, the more times it happens. Because the very next day, I was doing the runs, going through the Pyro Gorge, and there's this little old truck with this little old gentleman plodding along the 70 k through the, through the, through the gorge, come to the double, double, you know, the overtaken places, didn't move over, just carried on, and I was singing in tongues, <laughs> blessing him. <laughs> Anyway, Paul said, I had been crucified with Christ. In saying that, he became an outcast amongst his own people, amongst the Jews. Because he had identified himself with Christ. And the Jews looked upon the cross as very shameful, a very shameful way to die. And so, the moment you receive Christ, you are an alien in this world. You're the more normal. The truth is known. But... People around you will react to you. And particularly, even in Christian circles, you know, when you get filled with the Spirit and start speaking in other tongues, the devil doesn't like that. He gets cranky with that, and I'll talk about that later. And it's, it's also in the grace message. What, what is attacked the most is what gives you the most benefit in the things of God. The religious people start to rise up. Man. And we've had a few really <laughs> exciting, exciting things. Anyway, so we are identified with Christ. It's a union with Christ. Well, we can understand that. It's like when you join the army. If you wanted to join the army. And what is the first thing you do? You give allegiance to the queen, and then you're given this uniform that identifies you with that army. Then there's a different ranks in the army. Now, the non-commissioned officers, officers, which is up to... Sergeant, Staff Sergeant, and, and that thing, and then you've got First Lieutenants. When you get to the, the Commission Officers, which is like First Lieutenant upwards, that's the uh, rank that you actually salute. Now you're not saluting the person, you're saluting his rank. You're saluting what he represents, not who he is. Because when you've been in the army, as I was in the army, I was in the Air Force as well, and there's some of the people you don't want to salute. <laughs> but you're not saluting them. You've got to get that into your into your mind that you're not saluting that person. You're saluting the office that they hold. And so there's a when you when you join the army or air force, you, you you become through what you wear and that you become a new culture within that. Is that right? When you become a Christian, you become a new culture. It's not it's not where you come from. You're a new creation in Christ. You're a new Okay, I know cultures bring in the different different aspects, but if it's not biblical, then it's not right, regardless of where you come from. Is that right? You can't hold on to those things. You have to look to see what does the word say about this. It's like when you join the police. If you join the police force, you're given a badge. You're given a uniform. Once once again, it's the uniform and the badge that gives you the authority, not you. It's the authority. When you receive Jesus Christ, you're given a badge, you're given an authority, and you're given a uniform because you're clothed in Him. Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. God gave you that. <clears throat> and you're, once again, you're in a new culture. Totally different culture. Like, if, you, uh, if you're in the army and, and you do something wrong, then you can be sent to the stockade, you can be sent to the... the, the the place of punishment. If you're in the, in the police, you will, there's also um, areas of punishment, area, if you even get kicked out of the force, if you misbehave. And the things of God, God's grace is so great 
that even when you mess up, he's always pulling you back in. Yes. He never gives up on you. He's always working to bring you back. There is no outcast in Christ. God never gives up. And you see that, you know, sometimes we, we, we get a bit worried about our children. The thing is that once, a, once your children are in your household, and say, okay, say they even receive Christ as, as, a, as a young child, even if they go away, God never gives up. He will be constantly, by through the Holy Spirit, drawing them back to that truth. Never gives up. Isn't that awesome? He never gives up. Yeah, I was watching a program yesterday on, I think it was on Chai TV, it was one of them anyway, and it's called Give Me an Answer. Anyone else seen that? <laughs> it's, it's such a, you've seen it, that's good. You, you know what I'm saying, is this guy, he goes to the universities and he talks to these, these brains that are all around him and they're throwing questions at him all the time about um, evolution and, and how, why should we believe in Christ and he, one of the things he said to, said to the thing, okay, you think we just happened? Oh, yes, yes, we just happened. Over billions of years we evolved. And he said, well, for a start, he says, you've got more faith than I have. <laughs> Which I thought was a fair comment. He turned to the camera and he said, see that camera? That camera, from what it was a few years ago, is a brilliant piece of equipment for what it can do. He said, yet the human eye is still far greater. And the, and the guy, and, oh yeah, 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 that's right, he said, but, but you see, the camera evolved over the years from what it was to what it is now, so anything uh, will change in the space of time. And he said, yes, I agree with you up to a point. He said, but who created the camera? And the guy said, oh, yeah, yeah. you didn't really have an answer. And he kept on hitting them all the time, hitting them back, you know, and, uh, but I was thinking, these people are the future brains. These are the ones that are going to be in Parliament. These are the ones that are going to be ruling over us. They need to get saved. They're so brainy, they're stupid. <laughs> There's no other word for it. I mean, how can anyone believe in evolution? How can anyone believe a little bit of seaweed? Well, right from the start, you know, it doesn't make sense. A little piece of seaweed one day wasn't happy and he jumped out of the sea and became, well, he became a fish or became a kangaroo or something over billions of years. And you think, how can you breathe that? <laughs> well, they do. They said, billions of years made, made it happen. So, well, if you want to believe, you come from a monkey, fair enough. <laughs> I know there's some ugly people in the world, but we still don't have to believe that. <laughs> so when Sue and I were going out, and I used to have her on with different things, because I just like to do that. I said, to her, you know, I said, there's proof that you came from a monkey. And she said, how do you work that? I said, look at your hands. Your hands are like that. She said, yes. I said, that means you were swinging from trees. <laughs> But think it logically. You wouldn't want your hands like that. It'd be a blinking nuisance, wouldn't they? It'd be catching up in everything. Couldn't even get it in your pocket. She used to leave me in the early days, but anyway, she didn't leave that. <laughs> so yeah, if you ever want, it, want some stimulation, if you just um, you know, give me an answer, I tell you what, those guys are are a cracker because the things they believe. So I can go to the to the um, laboratory and create life. <laughs> and he said, he said, just like, like it was in the beginning, you know, how your gases were formed and all that. He said, yes, you can do that. He said, I don't dispute that. You can do much. He said, but you can't actually create life. You can't create a human being. You can play around with genetics and you can play around, but basically it still needs a man and a woman for a baby. So we've still got a use. Amen. Okay, <laughs> Romans 6.6, 6. Romans 6.6, 6. knowing this that our old man, let's go back to verse 5, for if we have united together in the likeness of his death, certainly also shall we be in the likeness of his resurrection, his resur resurrection power flows through us, most of us wouldn't, wouldn't really believe that, but the more you get to know him, the more you realise what resources you have inside of you. Verse 6, knowing this, that an old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should be no longer be slaves of sin. The old man being the, the old you, the, 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 
non-recreated person, as it were. Not necessarily me. Should be old people, which wouldn't be sound better, wouldn't it? But anyway, let's move on. When Christ was nailed to the cross, justice started to unfold. What was happening in hell? What was happening in heaven? It was preparation. Preparation for his victory. Because God knew, knew, and Jesus knew, otherwise he wouldn't have done what he did. He knew what the victory would be, and the devil would be completely defeated. Well, why isn't he defeated in our present, present day? Why are we so many um, wars and sickness and all these things happening? Is because Christ, that what Christ has already purchased for us is not being appropriated by the body of Christ. We can change lives. And like I said in the beginning when I started doing this series, I will prove to you that the sickness is spiritual, not physical. It's physical to a point, but initially it's spiritual that changes it. Now I've had a lot of debates with people over this, even other pastors, and we've got into some really good discussions about it. But I am totally convinced that any condition in your body can be changed spiritually first and then physically. Otherwise, what is the purpose of words? What is the purpose of praying? If we can't, through our words, change lives. Is that right? When the world saw Jesus, when all those the people that were milling around, when they saw Jesus put on the cross, they only saw him with their sense knowledge, their eye gate, as it were, they were visualizing, they could see Jesus on the cross, and that's all they saw was the physical state that he was in. They did not realize the spiritual nature of what was taking place, because God saw the spiritual side, the angels saw the spiritual side, the demonic realm saw the spiritual side of what was happening and what was about to change. That's where the excitement comes in, is that if we live in our sense knowledge, we'll never rise above where we are today, where you are right now. If, we, if you're not prepared to, to say, well, if I, if I, I've got to see it before I believe it. If that is your whole way of, of looking at life, you're never actually going to move in faith to see life-changing things happen. That was good, brother. Well done. Yes, okay, I enjoyed that. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 5. <coughs> Start at verse 17, I think we'll make more sense. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Remember, that's where your faith comes in. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we may become the righteousness of God in him. Does that light your wood? Now, 1 Peter 2, 4. Now, we all know this verse. We've probably quoted it many times. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. Let's go to verse 22. Who committed no sin, nor was the seed found in his mouth. That's Jesus. Verse 23, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. 
who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. Now we all quote that one, by whose stripes we were healed. To really grasp that, particularly when you're in pain and you've got, to say, you know, life-threatening disease, you've really got to, got to work in your spirit. You've got, you've got to spend time in the Word to be able to, to believe it. See, what you, what you spend most time in is what you believe. This is why we're seeing so many uh, horrific murders and brutality today is because of the amount of videos that are around and people are constantly just watching that sort of stuff. Their actual spirit becomes almost desensitized to that sort of thing and they start to think that some of the things that they see are normal and, and they live not in the, in the truth of today, they live in, a, in another world. So what goes in all the time, so I'm not saying not to watch that, I enjoy an occasional war movie and things like that, or you know, suspense, spy things and that sort of thing, but I make sure that I have far more of the Christian intake than what I do of the world's intake, because I want my spirit to stay built up, and I don't want to become desensitized to the things of God. Do you know where I'm coming from here? I'm not trying to be super spiritual, I'm just saying that that what you hear is what you become. Now, if you're around people that, and some of us can't avoid it because it might be our, you know, our friends and our spouses or whatever, who are negative people, then we've really got to protect our spirit. And, and on the inside, when they say something negative, just make sure that we say, no, I don't believe that. And, you know, I, and, and quote the scripture that will offset what, they, what they're saying because negativity will kill you. It will kill every part of you. Sorry, but it does. It's when you become, when you look to your future as a positive future, that's when your spirit starts rising. Mm -hmm. Now I heard something, actually it was just this, just this morning, and I thought, man, isn't it God good? He gives you, just gives you something uh, that you've always believed, but just sort of reinforces it. And he was saying about, um, when you pray in tongues, and if you have the gift of tongues, and you, and you let it go dormant, stir it up again, because it's a free gift that God's given you. It caused so much controversy. It got us kicked out of church many years ago, because we started speaking in tongues. Don't allow the devil to say, oh, that stuff doesn't work. That's just a waste of time. Don't allow that lie. It's life-changing. And what, what happens when you pray in tongues, you actually are de-stressing, detoxing your spirit. Yes. Not the Holy Spirit, your spirit. You're, you're changed. If you have some sickness in your body, then I guarantee if you started praying in tongues, rather than, than focusing on your problem, your problem would be less. It's a de stressing thing. And where, where is most of the stress, when we have stress, where does most of it hit us first? In the stomach, doesn't it? You have a churn, stomach, or <coughs> not in the stomach. And isn't it interesting, Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow living waters. And the living waters are speaking in tongues. Now, it's the only gift that you, you can make happen any time you want. I mean, any of the other gifts, will happen as the Spirit wills. But when you want to pray in tongues, you can do it any time you want, night or day. Yeah. And it is the greatest prayer. What I love about praying in the Spirit is that I can't put my foot in it. I can't get into witchcraft. <laughs> God, get it. No, it's, you pray, Lord, bless them, and I'll pray for them. Pray in the Spirit. Because you can't make a mistake, and I've been known to make mistakes. <laughs> <clears throat> One or two. <laughs> and so, this is the exciting part, is that if you're sick, make sure you pray in tongues. Because healing is spiritual. How can you work out it's spiritual when I got this, desert, I got this problem through an accident? Or I got this problem 
because say I worked with asbestos and I've got asbestos lungs or I was a coal miner and I got the coalman's um, um, lungs, how can you say it's spiritual? It's quite simple. The condition you got may have been through any any type of whatever work thing that you say, you know, RSI, if you're on computers and all this sort of different problems can be created by you through your workplace. But the thing that can change you is the Word of God. Now we were in a meeting where this man came in, he was off the street, he was, he, he could just literally, he just shuffled, his lungs were down to the fact that there was about a quarter of one lung that was still operating, and they found out that he had been a coal miner, and he had the coal miner's lungs, which is all the constant dust, because in those days, of course, they weren't so osh conscious as what they are today about safety, which is which is good. So his his lungs are literally one had, had just calcified with the with lack of use and, and through all the dust that had got there, and the other was uh, he could not climb the stairs, and there was about or about six or seven stairs. He could not climb those stairs because he got too out of breath. You know, the following week after he'd been prayed for. He not only walked to the podium, but he, he walked up those stairs and he spoke like he was not out of breath. And he said, the doctors have examined me and they don't know what's happened. He said, but I've got two perfectly good lungs. Okay, is that spiritual or physical? Spiritual to physical. He got a physical um, healing. But it came from the spirit because the doctors couldn't do anything. Now we've been given doctors and nurses as an interim measure. But there's many times the doctors say that there's nothing can be done for you. When the doctors say that, that's when Jesus Christ can kick in big time. You may have trouble with accepting this, particularly if you're a nurse or if you you've been in, in the medical profession because you see you see what what um, what drugs can do and how they cure this and help this and do that, which is good. If you've got a headache, I'm not saying not to take an aspirin or whatever you need. But what I'm saying is there's a, there's a dimension here we can tap into and see life changing. And the, and the life-changing thing, most of the most of the sickness, apart from what I've just said about accidents and work-related things, most sickness today comes through stress. Yeah. So if you pray in the Spirit and you're being de-stressed, God, as you pray in the Spirit, God might just say, oh, you need to forgive that person, or you need to let this go, or if some person driving up the wall while you're driving, you need to bless them. <laughs> As you're praying, the Spirit of God, because, you know, some of we do things and we think, why do we do that? And just like I was sharing before about driving, you know, I'm a lot more calm now. But every so often, you know, over a period of time, if, if I don't, if I don't make a conscious step, hey, I'm walking in love, I'm walking in peace. Bless that person. Obviously, they're not in a hurry like I am. <laughs> Bless their little heart. Good to be so spiritual, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a wonderful lot. Well done. But if we can, if we can grasp this, to be detox, be stressed, just through praying in tongues. Now I know initially it's quite it can be an effort, and if you haven't done it for a while, to get back into it becomes a bit of an effort. But you can pray in tongues when you're driving. You can pray in tongues any time, any time you want. Doesn't matter where, doesn't matter when. Doesn't have to be loud tongues, it can be just soft tongues. But just start practicing praying in tongues. You see, we've had examples. Paul said he prayed in tongues more than anybody else. Smith Wigglesworth prayed in tongues more than anyone else. Now, what's the secret of your power? As though it's going to be some sort of, you know, whatever. The secret of his power was praying in tongues. Because he, whilst you're praying in tongues, you, you're developing within you the perfect will of God as well. It's edifying you, but it all, also can be edifying others. Particularly, say, in your family. You've got some family problems, pray in tongues. You will give the peace and then your peace is transferable to them. 
You know, when you have agitated people around you, they agitate you, don't they? Don't they? You don't know what they think. <clears throat> oh, I'll move on then. Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. He became a curse for us. Now, when you live out of being sin conscious, then you, you don't go forward because you're always trying to be good, and the slightest little thing you do wrong, you, you fall under condemnation and guilt. For instance, once again, you're driving on the open road, right? And you're, you're sort of semi-conscious or a little bit conscious of the speed you're going and you're just trying trying to do what's right. And you see a policeman on the side of the road. Where do your eyes first go to? The speedo, speedo doesn't it? <laughs> it's the first thing you do. So what are you? You're semi-conscious. Well, you're ticket-conscious. <laughs> Or you're driving along, I mean, driving on, on the big, you know, the open plains um, the other side of Madame was going to Auckland. I was driving along and uh, I saw a police car at the corner of coming down, down the road. And so I had to thing on cruise control. That's a good thing, cruise control, isn't it? Right? <laughs> Keeps you within the limits. When, you, when you're praying or, you know, or you're singing to the Lord and you put your foot down and you're like, oh, you realize. Like, Cruise control, that's a brilliant thing. Anyway, I was driving up, as I was driving up, looked at the rear vision mirror, I could see this police car getting closer, closer and closer. So on the cruise control, you go down a few notches. So I thought, well, you irritate me, so I'm going to irritate, I'm going to sit at 95. <laughs> Just for the blessing. <laughs> see, you're sin conscious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's still a little bit. See, my wife knows that. She knows that. She knows a little bit of work to be done. Okay. I've got to move on now. Um, <laughs> he became sin for us. Okay. Philippians 3.10. just want to get through these scriptures. It's important that um, we, we're spoken. We've shifted up. Embarrassed and you can't find it. 310. So after, after Genesis, have you ever found it? 310. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to the dead, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So as we as we identify with Christ, we identify with his death, but we don't have to die. Paul said he wanted to, to do the same as Jesus, but he couldn't do that. He's the, Jesus is the only one that was sin free. He's the only one that could, because of, of the blood that was in him, the God blood that was in him, he's the only one that could do what he did. No one else could do it. So let's understand this. We have resurrection power within us. The, the spiritual suffering that Jesus went through, he took your sickness, your disease, your sin, your sorrows, your griefs upon the cross. So when we learn to roll them over on him and understand if there's any part of your body that isn't functioning properly today through through grasping that Jesus took that on the cross. Now don't try and, and um, who was it that one of the great evangelists during the time of the bubonic plague John G. Lake, that was the one here. He was able to go in amongst the bubonic plague and the doctors could not understand why he hadn't caught it because it was a very contagious disease. 
And so they, he said, well, I'll prove to you that God protects me. And he, and they took some foam from um, saliva and from one of the people that had died, and they put it on his hand. And under the microscope, these that froth was just full of, of the demonic power, the germs and the, and the things that were there. They were alive. But as soon as it touched his hand, they died immediately. Yeah. That's spiritual, isn't it? Yeah. Totally spiritual. We can walk in the spirit because God has given us that. Yeah. How many times, you may have heard over the years, the different testimonies where people were, where the doctors have said, there's no hope. Don't ever worry about what the doctors say. That's why they still call it a practice. Now, I love them, don't get me wrong. <laughs> they don't know everything. They do their best with the tools they have. And I appreciate that. I went to the doctor the other day. I don't have any problem, but what I'm saying is that there is a spiritual connection that we can make. I'm speaking to those, those parts, in the name of Jesus, you, got, you say you've got a crook leg, in the name of Jesus, I speak this leg strong, start to move it, strong in the Holy Ghost, strong in the name of Jesus. And you will find that it will get stronger. But if you keep speaking your problem, then you're not going to get the breakthrough that you want. Isn't that exciting? Yes. The, world, the Word heals our spirits. The Word recreates us. The Word produces faith. We are a new creation in Christ. The Word produces faith. In the beginning was the Word. Is that right? Now he starts off. In the beginning was the Word. It's the Word that will change. What you speak, what you declare, will start to change you. Isn't that exciting? Yes. Right, let's finish on one scripture. Ephesians 1 3. Ephesians 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Well, the heavenly places are when we have received Christ. We are called to bring down heaven to earth. Wouldn't that be great? Have more of that. Bring down heaven to earth. Walk in that. Okay, let's all stand.